to uh, another episode of Winning with AI. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by James Poulter. We're very lucky to have you on the show. James is the current CEO and co-founder at Vixen Labs, a board advisor for technology ethics at Christian Vision and Open the Open Voice Network, uh, startup advisor at Impact Central. He's also the founder of Voice2, the UK's leading voice-first community and think tank and has held previous leadership positions in roles such as Lego, uh, sorry, companies such as Lego and agencies Edelman, uh, where we actually initially met. Um, yeah. So you can see why I was really excited to have you on the show today. And I actually did have one opening question, James. How have you got time to do anything when you're doing all those things? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question, Josh. Like uh, Limited, I would say. The, the biggest thing is having an amazing team of people around me to make sure that, that happens, right? So, um, yeah, I, I have massive respect, to, particularly this year as we've gone on such a transition, as I'm sure we'll get into from the world of just voice technology to this much broader space of AI. Um, it has brought so many challenges and opportunities with it. But um, yeah, great team around us has, has enabled us to get there. No, that's great. I can imagine. Um, so today, uh, we'll, we'll be discussing 2024 trends in AI. Yeah. Now, as, as we've just been talking about earlier, we can chat a little bit around the wider view of where AI is going. I mean, 2023 has been such a, a breakout year for AI in general, mm. whether or not that's meant everyone calls AI is generative AI now, is, is a general general phrase. Um, but what I'd be really keen to know is your thoughts on what key trends are going to happen, whether that's voice, communication, uh, and where you think we're going to go next year. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean... Hey, it has been, as I said, like a transformative year and we've seen so much change in the space of these past 12 months as we record here in the, in the first week of December. And you know, we're only a week or so on from the first anniversary of ChatGPT being released into the wild. Uh, as we record, just even this week, we've had the Gemini release come from Google, which seems like it is going to bring some amazing advancements when it comes to multimodal artificial intelligence to their platforms. And obviously there is daily releases coming still from many of the big companies like Microsoft, Anthropic, Amazon, uh, and many others. And, and obviously OpenAI will continue as they have done to push what they're doing too. So as we look ahead for the next year, I think anybody's guess is going to be probably far wide of the mark, but I'm going to give it a go of giving you a few kind of key things I think are going to happen. Um, over the next uh, you know, 12, maybe to 24 months. And I, I say 24 months because I think that we have operated in this kind of very hockey stick level trajectory of change over the past year. You know, that kind of immediate up and to the right kind of graph that everyone has been looking at, whether it's adoption of uh, conversational AI tools, whether it is the usage of some of these big platforms and also the kind of fear and trust and privacy issues that have been raised with them. But as we look forward, I think we can see a bit of a, a dampening of that slope. Um, there is only so fast that this kind of exponential uh, advancement can continue at. Uh, one, because the pace of change makes it very difficult for organizations and businesses, the people that we here at, at Vixen Labs and that you guys uh, deal with at Cloud Apps to actually adopt this kind of tech. But also because we have seen the kind of big step change moment um, and it takes a while for these things to bed in and for the use cases to be borne out. So I think the first trend, I would say, is actually a slowing down of the advancements, but more we move um, from what I'd see as a kind of innovation phase into an operational phase um, as as we kind of go into the start of the new year. That's a really interesting point, that, because actually 2024 surely it's almost going to be a bit of a catch-up year <laughs> because you've got so many different forms of AI now as well. Obviously, we're talking about conversational here. We're talking about generative AI. You've got voice. You've got so many different pieces, bits and pieces to it. Um, so would, would you say in terms of business adoption that there's almost that lag? I know we see probably in UK-specific staff but around 28% of businesses in the UK or adopting AI at the moment. So that's mm. still only a very small proportion it compared is, yeah. to the amount of people talking about it. <laughs> I think there's a big um, disparity there. I think there's a big disparity there is that people, there is a lot of talk about it. And even when you quote stats like that, which I don't disbelieve, but it's important to qualify what we mean by adopting AI. Mm. Uh, many people are adopting AI by accident or out of with that, not with any proactive choice. And, and what I mean by that is that, you know, if you think about the largest software suites that most of us run our businesses on today, 
Microsoft Office, Google Suites, tools like Salesforce and Adobe that power many of these businesses. Of course, AI is now ripped through those things and it's being added at a, at a lightning pace by the adoption of these technologies. Um, and businesses are working out, okay, this stuff is here now. What do I do about it? <laughs> like, what do I do with it? Then you've got the more proactive ones, which I would say is who are actively going out into the market and saying, AI is now out there. I need to bring it in. And I think those are the ones that are maybe going to have a different kind of year next year. It's inevitable that as we go into 2024, all of us will adopt AI in some fashion. It's almost inevitable and potentially it's unavoidable. It's coming yeah. at us in all of the tech we already use. Um, but don't you think it's going to be like you know, just an inevitability that we all have to have put up with it? I mean, it's it's actually a really good point that you just made around or just circling back to the the point of uh are you <laughs> around the stat, who's using it and are you using it? You talk about teams, you talk about everything. So I was at a conference this week actually, mm. um, and Microsoft were presenting and it was all of the how they're integrating AI into all their products, which is quite interesting. Um uh which makes you think actually that adoption rate's gonna increase, but You've recently released a, an index report that came out yeah. and it was great to listen to that yesterday on one of your webinars. So happy for you to talk about that a little bit more as well and let us know about it. But in that, you actually raised the point and I saw two stats and that resonated quite a lot with me. Of, I think you asked people around, you know, are they using it? What's the adoption rate? Um, how comfortable you are with it? And then later on, you had people, you asked this kind of a similar question in a different way about are you using it? And actually... They didn't quite match up. It shows depends right. on the question you're asking people. Depends on how they're adopting it. Um, and you've got things like even you know Alexa for voice AI um, just went off there. I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> uh, and then you've also got uh, AI in the sense of you do have your, your ChatGPT, your LLMs, which are people are using maybe not in the business. So when I said twenty eight percent adoption, instead. They're using it as by themselves, but personal use, which is still an yeah. AI adoption. So, yeah, what what are your thoughts yeah. on that? Feel free to let us know. Well, yeah, and more. so we see this this adoption happening. I would say probably at three different tiers. the The, the first tier is the the personal level. You and I, right? Whether mm -hmm. you are doing it for your work tasks, doing it for your home tasks, or somewhere in between. We are all having to learn to adopt and trying to adopt the use of these AI tools, and and that could be like you say, I'm talking to my smart speaker in my living room, or I'm asking for a new track on my Siri, you know, in my car uh, when I'm driving along, or it might be yeah, I'm beginning to use some of these tools like ChatGPT and others to kind of plan a shopping list or put together an itinerary for a ho holiday or things like that. And that personal use naturally bleeds over into our work lives because it's inevitable that if you find it useful in personal capabilities, you're going to start applying it in commercial applications. But it, that isn't the business adopting it. It's us adopting it as individuals. The yeah. next layer up, I think, is teams looking for tools, right? And so when I say teams are looking for tools, that is, hey, we're a marketing team. We use HubSpot. Maybe we could start using the HubSpot AI to start being smarter about writing our follow-up emails. Or, hey, I'm an IT person. I'm deploying Google Cloud across my entire organization. Maybe I'm going to put in a small generative app or a chatbot into Slack to help us manage the Echo Data stuff. That's teams looking for tools for certain use cases. Then you've got the kind of the, the macro top tier category, and that's the enterprise adoption. That's when whole organizations, whole businesses go looking for solutions, not just tools. Uh, and that's when, hey, we've got a problem to solve here. Let's go bring a bunch of these different things in concert with one another together and act you know, very proactively to adopt, quote unquote, adopt AI. And I think that there are far fewer than that 28% you, you quoted there that are in that third mode yet. But I think by the time we get to the end of next year, so my first prediction would be that that is, we are going into the first year of yep. enterprises innovating in that adoption. Uh, and it won't, I think, be until 2025 that we see it kind of go into the operational phase, which is that third tier. We, I always talk about these technology revolutions going in these three phases, education, innovation, operation. And this year, it feels like 2023 has been the year of education. We've been learning at a personal a team, a business level, what is this stuff? Right, because it's it's yeah. kind of come out of uh, you know left field. Next year, I feel like we're in the innovation phase as individuals, as teams, and as enterprises of going, what can be done? What are the possibilities now that we understand what this stuff is? 
but it's only the year after that once you've kind of shored up the business case of why you're going to do it the operation really comes and and we've seen this happen with voice technology over a number of years now when we first started vixen labs back in 2018 and we're coming up on our, our five-year anniversary next week we were very much in that education phase people had heard of alexa they might have bought a device they might have one in the living room uh, or playing around with it in their kitchen, but businesses certainly weren't doing anything. And I often compare it to like the Carling Eye Pint phase of um, adoption. You might remember that. Back I in do the day. remember that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think either of us worked <laughs> on that campaign, but like, yeah, you know, back in the day, these early um, apps that came out on the App Store that were like complete novelty things to play around with. You know, at the pub, if you don't know what I'm talking about, the Carling Eye Pint, an app that literally simulated a pint of lager that you could hold up to your face and look like you were drinking it. Complete rubbish. But, you know, they showed the capability of the technology. Even silly apps like that showed it off. Yeah. That an accelerometer, that a screen, that a touch screen interface um, with, with speakers that you could hear across a table in, in a crowded pub, it brought together those features and delivered it. We saw the same thing with voice. And we're seeing the same thing now with some of the creative ex executions that are possible with things like Dali and ChatGPT. But yeah. Next year, I think we enter into 2024 being that real innovation phase where we begin to work out what's this really useful for at, at more scale than we have done in the past few months. And, and it's important to remember, it's only been a few months, really, that most people have had time to um, get their heads and hearts around this. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, you know, all great points. And it's interesting that that, that phrase of education, innovation, uh, and what was the last one? Sorry, operation. We see, operation. yeah, that's that third yeah, phase okay. where it kind of goes into business as usual, not just some innovation team's job to understand it. Yeah, okay, I like that. So this this year's been all. It's definitely been an education year, and it's it's funny you say. I mean, ChatGPT is coming up to, or it's one year anniversary. Yeah, um, that's really pushed AI in that form anyway into the mainstream, mm. and that adoption as well at a business level, I'm sure the innovation next year is definitely going to happen because we're getting, for example, at cloud apps, more and more questions about actually, okay, um, we've, we've got an AI product that sits in a certain part. We're around the sales enablement, things like that, but it can do a lot more than that. And actually we're starting to get questions asked to us more and more about what can it do. And yeah. you can see it's almost like a, that education phase is, is coming to an end and people are starting to click uh, I can actually use this for various yeah. different tasks um, and similar to like voice and things like that as well. Uh, th there's a whole host of things we can be doing to, to improve efficiencies and things like that. Yeah. So are there any key advancements in technology or any potential new integrations that you can see that's going to accelerate the likes of the communicational AI? So this past week, we've seen the launch of what's called the Gemini model from Google. And this is one of the first models that can truly be thought of as being what's called multimodal. Um, just to unpack what that means. Up until now, most of these types of models that we've played around with, if you've used ChatGPT, if you've used like Midjourney for creating images or Dali, most of them are single or dual modal, basically text to image or image to image or text to text or video to video. In some cases, if you look at some of the uh, like resemble.ai or, or tools like that, that have been able to kind of um, take a video and change it from one style to another, but they're all, they're all single modal or, or dual modal one to another. A multimodal model um, like Gemini basically allows us to go across those different paradigms. So I can write text and it can produce a video because it understands the, not just the text that I've created, but it understands the concept of what I was talking about within that text. Equally, it can go the other way that you can feed it video or feed it images and it can understand the context of what's in that image and then reply to you in text or potentially reply to you with a follow-up image. And these multimodal models, they unlock a whole new level of assistance because what it allows the computing to do is behave much more like a human, behave much more like we would do. Because obviously we don't just experience the world through text or images alone or video alone. We, we take them in concert with one another and we respond in concert with one another in, in a kind of, you know, uh, 4D kind of fashion. 
So these models are going to be particularly exciting as they begin to roll out next year. Gemini's just launched this week. It is now powering behind the scenes of Bard with the Gemini Pro model, which is the kind of mid-size yeah. model. Yeah, yeah. The um, Ultra model, which will be available for developers to play with, is in, in development now. And the Nano model has just been rolled out this week to the Google Pixel 8 Pro and will come to other devices um, soon, which is basically a, a miniaturized version of the model that allows it to do text um, uh, language work on device meaning it doesn't need a cloud connection which is a, a huge advancement um and Massive. so these models yeah. i think are going to be really fascinating next year because you'll begin to see one being able to do the types of things that typically we've only been able to do with a cloud connection on a browser or in an app on a device without having to have any connectivity which unlocks the ability of this work to uh, go to markets where you have low or no te technology connectivity thinking about being able to do things like um predictive text modeling for example on the underground where you don't have a connection or in you know, sub-Saharan Africa, where it's hard to kind of get a cell service, still being able to have some of like the recording and language translation work that wasn't otherwise possible. So it unlocks all sorts of interesting use cases when it comes onto the device. Um, but overall, it means for for business users, you know, imagine being able to um, you know, record a sales presentation that you, a colleague is is giving, and then a model being able to analyze not just the words that that person said, but look at the slides that were being presented at the same time and the tone of voice and the way in which that person was presenting, whether or not they were using hand gestures, whether or not their camera was fuzzy, all those kind of things. Imagine being able to have a model be able to go look at the hours and hours and hours of those calls for you and give you a digest and be your coach. Now, up until now, it could do that on the text that you could feed it from the transcript yeah. of this Zoom call, but it wouldn't have an understanding of everything else that was going on. So you know, that's just one discrete example, but you imagine many more use cases beginning to emerge when a AI coach can have a full contextual awareness of who we are, what we're doing, how we're working. I mean, that that potential is, is massive. And I think the, the the important thing is there about multimodal, and you've, you've just gone through it, is the ability to understand the way we come across the way we communicate is not always especially <laughs> in the uk it's not always straightforward sometimes we're being sarcastic sometimes you're doing you know you, your language is, right. is so complex mm -hmm. so there's still that i feel like at the moment because we use recorders for things you know that provide transcripts at the end of this for example yeah. one jumped into this automatically i was like probably not have that today you don't need it um but it always jumps on, listens, gives me an email to write after and follow up. The reality is it's probably 50% accurate in terms yeah. it's got the, the key points in, which is useful. Again, efficiency um, in business, in day-to-day -day life. Uh, but it's not it's not necessarily understanding every little That's nuance right. and yeah. keywords. And exactly. It, it I, picks I, up on things. I'll give you another example. I mean, one of the things that we've seen a lot of advancement in the past 12 months, we've been doing this type of work with the likes of Dyson, Verizon in the US, um, and, and some other clients where we're looking at how can we make the experience of calling up custom services a more conversational, more helpful experience using large language models. Uh, we've done that up so far with things like the Alexa skill we built for Dyson. So if you've got an issue with your Dyson product, you can open up the Alexa uh, skill, ask it to talk to Dyson Care, and gradually walk through uh, a step-by-step -step guide, hands-free, with being able to get, can lean out their filter head, for example, in your yeah. in your vacuum cleaner, and um, that's that's a great experience. But it's very much a turn by turn, and also the the skill only knows what you're saying. Um, it only has the mm -hmm. context of the the language you're giving it. Imagine a world where you can now also just literally hold up the Dyson vacuum in front of a a camera. And it understands, oh, that's what's going wrong because I can see yeah. the filter head is clogged. And also I can see which model vacuum you're holding. I don't need to go through the process of trying to get your serial number to deduce it because I know, oh, that device comes with yellow on the bracket in the middle. Therefore, it's a V12. Therefore, here's what I need to do for you. you know, these types of examples are going to become hugely helpful, you know, even down to the simple thing of being down the back of your you know, Wi-Fi router trying to fix yeah. uh, whether or not it's plugged into the right socket hey, I'm just going to send a picture to a customer services bot and it's going to tell me whether or not it's plugged into the right place. So multimodal image generation, you know, this type of stuff is going to transform you know, things like customer services, sales processes, and lots of other parts of our business that we probably haven't even thought of yet. Um, but it, you know, th that multimodality, um, along with businesses adopting it beyond just individual tools, but into you know, bringing these different services in concert with one another with the software they're already using, uh, is going to open up all sorts of new opportunities. Yeah, and that's really interesting. There's two points 
which I want to pick up on. I think the first is you touched upon at the end there. Um, businesses are going to look at it in not just individual points so or parts, which is a conversation that I've been trying to have with a lot of people is actually not even necessarily about cloud apps, but looking at your, your AI strategy. You don't want to build an individual standalone necessarily AI strategy. What you want to do is look at what, what you're trying to solve, uh, what yeah. your problems are, and what direction do you need software or AI to solve and, and help you as a business. Do you think that uh, you think we'll see more, especially maybe not even in 2024, might be a bit further beyond, but businesses starting to adopt new technologies and actually realize, you know, they don't need seven different um, language models. <laughs> yeah. All they need is, is something that does it, something that's more unified, something that works to solve the problem after. Do you think there's more exploration and an opportunity in that area? Yeah, I think there's a real danger for businesses right now with all of the rhetoric that's going on, all the noise in the space to start putting AI on some kind of pedestal as if it's the only thing that's going to solve your business problems. Like ultimately, most of the time, it's not. Um, it, but it might help you in certain aspects of the business. And you should never be saying, well, what's our yeah, kind of AI? The, the goal of the AI strategy should never be to have achieved deploying AI. Like that's not the point. The goal of the AI strategy is to look at what are the business objectives you're trying to achieve in the first place. And if AI technology or any other tech for that matter, or you know, human ingenuity and process can be brought into place to make you get there. That's the important point. And I often talk about you know, cultures of innovation within businesses uh, are built on a number of things. But the first is that they are able to listen well, that they look at their organization mm -hmm. and they say, where are there sensors in my organization that are telling me something about how this process, this operation, this team is broken? And if you're really good at listening, then you'll listen and hear and see where those operational problems come. And it's only at that point that then you go to the second stage, which is coming up with alternatives. And AI might be that alternative that comes along. And the third part of it is, you know, you might have to get let something else go. You know, teams that are really good at being innovative are really, really good at killing their cows. You know, the ones that have, you know, kind of come along and gone, well, this thing got too fat, too bloated, too overweight. It's time to go to the slaughterhouse, push it in that direction. Like, yeah, you know, you've got to be good at that. And yeah. the, the um yeah, so I often talk about you know innovative teams. They're the ones that learn how to control by listening. They find mm -hmm. alternatives and they know how to delete stuff. Control or delete. That's how you reboot. That's how you get stuff going. So um innovation is is built on that. And your AI strategy has to be thought of in that way. It's not to say we have to achieve having deployed AI, otherwise we're going to get left behind. What we have to do is work out where are our problems and what are our solutions. And if the AI can help us get there, then great, deploy it. If it doesn't, move it out of the way and do something else. Yeah, 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 I completely agree. I think there is a, I don't know if it's a fear, if fear is fair to say, but I think it's, oh my God, we need to tick a box because someone's put on their OKRs or whatever they've got, yeah. KPIs. We need to implement AI in 2024. And and that could be, if like, you don't, you need to look at what problems you need to solve yeah. and, and implement that. Um, yeah. Whether this is next year or not, I know we're looking at trends, but you've made me think about one of the points earlier that you said. Um, you talk about you know multimodal AI; it's developing quickly. And then, if you're looking at business world, and I recently had a conversation which is really interesting, which is saying actually could potentially we see a point where I don't think maybe next year or even the next couple of years, but is a business uh, and is a, a vendor or is, is anything yeah. you know business to business having two conversations. Do you think we'll reach a stage where you'll see the two AIs talking to each other and actually you you talk about, you know, image recognition, model recognition, things like that. Yeah. It's going to be that level of detail now is, is so complex and it's only going to evolve. Do you think we'll have, for example, Vixen Labs talking to Cloud Apps as an example? We both want to buy each other's products or, you know, we want to get Vixen Labs involved. We've got a certain price threshold or, you know, certain criteria that we want to hit. You've got an AI which is saying, actually, we're only going to sell at this point and do this. You think we'll just put the two AIs together and they'll figure it out? When, when... In, in the longest, of, in the longest of science fiction terms, yes, I think that there probably is a, a world of that. In, in the shorter term, I think we see some nudges in this direction already. If you think about what a, OpenAI are trying to do with the GPTs that they've released in the GPT store that's due to come in, in coming weeks, it is a first foray into essentially saying there can be custom 
branded or business owned versions of these AIs that can go and take agency on your behalf. Now, for these things to operate in the way you've described in that kind of interoperable world, standards need to be established, you know, kind of gateways need to be made, um, APIs need to be well documented, probably a bunch of SDKs need to be deployed in different applications. But at a certain level, I think we will see certain examples of where this becomes possible. Think about, for example, just take a sector, um, say the travel sector. Yeah, it would make sense, right, that Hertz car rental or Euro or whoever it is that you use to kind of yeah. grab your car when you land in you know, Madeira and you're off on your holiday, that they might have an AI bot that can help you book a car. Yeah. It would be very sensible for that AI bot to also be able to talk to my British Airways, you know, kind of executive club bot that can redeem my points. And it would also make a lot of sense for that BA bot to also be able to talk to the Heathrow bot to be able to arrange my parking. And I should be able to go to ChatGPT and say, I want to travel to Mallorca on the 12th of September next year, sort it out. And it just goes and does those things. Now, within yeah. these kind of verticalized sectors, within these kind of clusters of different AIs that might exist, acting on behalf of these brands, I think in short order, we may begin to see something of that kind of orchestration begin to happen. The real question is, will we be giving commands to these individual brands to go and do that? Or will there be some kind of higher orchestration layer that we have a primary relationship with, e.g. an Alexa, a Google Assistant, ChatGPT, or one of these other players? And I think that that, for me, is the real question as we go into the next couple of years, is that will these ecosystems become robust enough? Will it be, become easy enough to discover the different apps that are out there or will yeah. we rely upon another AI agent that kind of sits in a, a macro overlay layer that controls that orchestration for us? It's the Jarvis example that we've seen, you know, from Iron Man or the Jetsons or any of these things, right? Yeah. Is that you don't have a whole army of bots that you're talking to. You just talk to one thing that's your companion and it goes and does the work for you. And, and that's, I think, an interesting opportunity for us to... Um, to look at if you look at what alexa are doing with the alexa llm that seems to be their approach the alexa llm will allow you to bring other large language models apis content and other things to the exactly. table and you leave it up to alexa to basically go and do the orchestration for you to go and work out which app or which bot has that for you because we know that conversationally without browsing through an app store which is most of yeah. the way, or relying upon advertising, or product, which obviously requires a surface that you're paying attention to for the advertising to be served to you. Yeah, Those yeah. seem to be the two mechanisms for discovering what applications are out there and what tools exist. Um, you know, we, because they are the proxy for the high street that you once walked down and the magazine that you once picked up, right? So if you don't have a digital proxy for the high street and the magazine, which up until now has been the app store, and the advertising horde, or yep. which is mostly on social media, then you have to have a way of discovering all of these different AIs that exist out there, or you have to have an AI that knows all those things infinitely because they have a directory of them and has the understanding and context to be able to go find them. And that's where I think the real power of the language model comes in because ChatGPT, when you ask it, hey, I want to go on holiday next September, can you sort it out? It understands what a holiday is. It understands when next September yeah. is. And it understands you enough to know that, well, you're probably going to be talking about flying with BA, staying in a Marriott hotel and using Hertz for rent a car. And it's just going to go up and do it. But without yeah. that context, it becomes very difficult for that future to come about. Yeah, and I imagine it's, uh, that's a logical next step. Um, I think the hard part is definitely going to be silo businesses and open communication. I mean, it probably leans into the the open AI world, not as in open AI, but as in actually open source AI and, and yes. being able to talk to each other quite easily. I do see an interface being the, the key of doing that because there's a degree of right now, even with our smartphones, there's a degree that you could probably do by just clicking buttons and actually you can see travel companies trying to do it when you book yeah. a flight, Apple on stuff but you're very limited in terms of options and the, the functionality is usually not brilliant because they don't have that interoperability developed yeah. very well. Usually. If, you, if you've ever tried to convert, as I did earlier this week, some Marriott points into BA Amex points, my word, like that is a journey that you're going to need half a day and a stiff drink to get through. Like this is like not simple things. And this is in the world of the internet where you've got buttons to click and screens to look at. So imagine doing yeah. that in a world where it's entirely driven by text prompts. Like it's, it's and let alone voice and it being headless. Like these are already in, on the internet, difficult things yeah. to achieve. So we, we either need um, 
And this will require trust and a certain degree of privacy being given up for the utility that you'll get in return. And I often say the history, as I said on the webinars this week, the history of the internet is the giving up of privacy for utility. If you yeah. can give me up enough, if I have to give up enough privacy to make that journey that I've described happen, trust me, I'd do it in a heartbeat because that's the most painful part of my job. Yeah. Uh, and it's the reason that I employ an executive assistant to do most of it half the time, you know what I mean? And I will continue to do so ad nauseum until the technology is robust enough to make sure it does it right every single time. Um, you know, travel agencies were built on the business that we're describing, but no AI is good enough to act as well as a travel agent right now. So like these, there will be certain sectors where this continues to be the case. Um, yep. And I think there will also always be things that you'll never want to give over to AI, you know, that, you know, buying a car, for example. Tesla have got it about as close as possible to buying a car sight unseen on the web, right? And many others are trying to emulate and follow that. But you would the reason that works is because there are enough Teslas on the road that you've gone and experienced. Yeah, you've right? had the physical, tangible experience uh, of doing yes. it. And yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I don't think that you're just going to go into ChatGPT next Tuesday and say, buy me a car and li let it just go off and do that job for you. Um, you know, there has to be a certain amount of human lived experience in some of the things that we're purchasing or, or decisions that we're making. So I don't think it's um that we kind of end up in a kind of wally kind of, you know, living in our you know, kind of chairs getting Little fat chairs. watching Netflix <laughs> kind of uh, mode forever. Yeah. Yeah, not quite yet anyway. But we actually one of my colleagues did actually buy a Tesla on the phone. Which I yeah. thought that is, yeah, I was quite surprised because it's quite a large, obviously quite a large, quite a big purchase um, to do on your phone. Like even that weirdly reassurance of doing it on your laptop because it feels more structured. Somehow even though there's no better. difference. I, know. <laughs> I know. I've done it myself before. Like, yeah, so browse on a different size screen, but somehow we get some reassurance out of it. And that's what I mean is that we are still, you know, as much as the technology accelerates, humans take a while to move in these yeah. paradigms. It takes a while for us to become comfortable with new form factors, with new ways of getting things done. And we see this already, even with our AI consumer index research that launched this week, um, which I'm sure people can find a link to in the show notes, um, oh, will <laughs> we'll, um, we'll show that, you know, in a very short space of time, about 30% of people in the UK and the US are already willing to make a purchase with a chatbot. But that doesn't actually surprise me all that much because the paradigm of doing so is, okay, texting back and forth, but you're ultimately still probably clicking a link and going and pressing buy probably on a desktop computer or maybe on a mobile device. It's not that different. Whereas even seven years into, maybe eight years into the kind of widespread adoption of smart speakers, the, the purchase rates of um, often quite cheap products, usually grocery products, is still only hovering in the 20 percentiles for most markets on, on Alexa. And you have to ask, well, why is that? It's because, well, as humans, it takes a lot of people a long time to get quite comfortable with just talking to a robot in a box in the corner of the living room and relying yeah. upon it to deliver even something as benign as batteries or dishwasher powder. So, you know, it will take us a while before I think any of us are ordering a car, you know, kind of on our smart speaker, because it just takes us time to get you know used to these types of things. Yeah. Habits, forming habits in a that's right. That acceptance. Um bef before we wrap up, just one thing I'd like to just touch upon is is ethics. Yeah. Um, yeah. just really keen to get just a couple of thoughts on that because obviously you've got a lot of involvement in that world and especially around AI. Um, you talked about it, you know, giving your data up as well and your privacy. Yeah. So what do you think, is there any kind of key trend around that, that point you'll see in 2024? Yeah, I'd say for the ethical debate, it's one that is raging in lots of different parts of the business world right now, but it's mostly at the level of governance and governments um, in terms of regulation. For those businesses that are out there that are beginning to implement AI, I think it's something that we need to think on really critically. Back to those three levels we had at the, the start. What are you going to ask of the people that work for you and the customers that you serve on the in most individual level? So thinking critically about how will we deploy AI tools in the organization? What data are we willing to capture of the people that work for us and the customers that we serve? I think that's the most critical question. Hopefully it's not a new question though. AI shouldn't really have changed that all that much. It's more than the question of what are you going to do with that data and how might you use it in the future that is the, the real challenge. When you come up a level, though, and you start asking, well, what tools, you know, coming back to my point about tools for teams, what tools are you going to adopt into which teams and how are you going to let those things interoperate? Are you happy and comfortable with the training data that has been used for some of these large language models to become able to deliver what they deliver for you? 
Um, are you making sure that you're not connecting different pieces of software together and allowing information to leak across different places? And certainly, are you making sure that teams are trained to understand how to use these things well? And then there's the, the most high level, which is at the enterprise scale. And an ethical AI framework should absolutely be a fundamental piece of the pie when putting together that AI strategy so that when you go into the decision making around which business problems are we going to solve and how are we going to solve them, that you don't accidentally put yourself into a kind of ethical you know, kind of cul-de-sac and you find it very difficult to kind of back back out of it. Yeah, AI ethics is not just an issue of technology, but it's one of people because ethics is something that is an issue yeah, of people. Definitely. And I often use the example that you might find a solution that allows you to cut 30% of costs in your call center by deploying AI. You then have a choice of do you make the 30% the of time given back to those people that were doing that job better? Or do you lose 30% of the people doing that job? That is an ethical discussion. It's not just a business one because you can make the choice tomorrow to re-employ those people or give them more time or make their work experience better or maybe yeah. they have to work less hours but ultimately you have a choice to make there so ethics is is an issue that will run all the way up and down the business from the individual level to the teams to the tools that we choose to to buy and certainly the the practices that we choose to adopt and things that we choose to build um, but ultimately ethics is everyone's job it's not just one person's decision somewhere in you know kind of a boardroom who wrote a policy document I th yeah, I think that sums it up brilliantly. Um, I think the would would it be fair to say you can wrap that up in a ethics and ethical approach? It shouldn't just be driven by AI, around AI or by AI. It should be just a business wide, consumer wide discussion that needs to always continue. It's not about the technology; it's about actually the people. Yeah, which is the case of digital transformation. Always, yeah. If you are yeah. if you're trying to bring in new technology. Think about the second and tertiary consequences that that brings in. Yes, you might get the initial hit um, and rush of you know, kind of uh, silicon dopamine that tells you that, hey, we've, we've moved the needle here on some KPI or OKR that we were looking at. But what are the secondary and tertiary consequences of that? These are the things where the ethical issues often arise. Mm -hmm. um and you know I, I just thinking critically about it before you start deploying stuff is absolutely crucial so if you're going to build a strategy think about what those pro those processes are think about what tools you're willing to adopt and ultimately like where do you want to play and how do you want to win it comes back to those simple you know kind of business planning processes uh, that we've seen um time ad nauseum but we have to make sure that we're doing this in a way that is fundamental and i am with this is that because these decisions will have quite significant generational consequences because we are the last group of people that will remember working today what it was like to live with this stuff before and after it was adopted. And that, I think, brings with us a unique challenge that the, the next generation, of, you know, if I think about my kids, they're eight and five, when they enter the workplace, this horse will have already bolted and the norms will have already been set and they'll be upset by the people like us that are building businesses today. So I, I you know, think that this is a challenge that is not to be taken lightly. Um, and it's one that we should do with, with utter care, but is also something that is hugely exciting and has you know, enormous possibilities for shaping what the future of it means to do work um, in this space and particularly knowledge work if, if that is what you're engaged in. So, uh, yeah, take up the mantle. It's a good one to good one to play with. That was, I mean, I don't think we could end on a better point than that. I mean, that was, yeah, that's fantastic. It, you know, as a dad with a three and one year old as well, that's, yeah, that just made me, it clicked in my head quite a lot. That's like, God, that's completely true. Um, uh, and we don't want to be frozen by the fear of, God, what decision should we make? Instead, um, we need to be pushing it and make the right yeah. choices and be willing to adapt and change as we learn, because we're learning about AI ourselves as well. So fair to say 2024, the year of innovation for AI. Um, there's a lot of points in there, and I'll summarize them as well. Uh, before we go and wrap up, just want to say, obviously, a huge thank you for coming on the show. Oh, my but pleasure. also, uh, is there a place where everyone can find your consumer index report and where yeah. where should they go get that? Yeah, so if you want to download this year's AI Consumer Index, which is our annual report and study into the adoption of AI by 7,000 consumers around the world, the UK, the US, Germany, Mexico, and Australia, you can get it for free. Go to vixenlabs.co slash research, where you can go and sign up to download that. You'll also be able to watch back the webinars that we've done this week and also get invited to take our AI readiness scorecard, which will help you as an organization work out where you're at in the process of adopting AI into the business. So uh, head to vixenlabs.co slash research. Uh, and people can find me on all the social medias, just 
at James Poulter in most places. Uh, happy to connect and uh, and answer questions there. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Uh, like we said earlier, there'll be a link to it, and I'll also try and put a, whether it's a QR code, depend on, you know, multimodal, how people want to do it. Um, it's really good. I joined one of your webinars this week. Uh, really enjoyed it. Really good data and insights into AI and obviously everything that's going on. So, yeah, thank you very much. And also, thank you very much for coming on today. I loved it and found it, all the points so interesting. So I'm going to go away and, and sit and think about a lot of them, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us, Josh. Appreciate it. Cheers, James. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Winning With AI. We hope to catch you every single Thursday on your favourite podcast channels on YouTube and the cloudapps.com slash podcast website. Now, please like, follow, subscribe, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.